Hello everyone. I just wanted to show you a couple of things first before I get into a Prezi. A couple of things I've added to the Blackboard down here. I've added a couple of articles, the links. You just click on this and it'll take you to the article. The first one is about factory farming and, and why Senator Cory Booker has introduced legislation to end it. Uh, some of the ideas that are related to the spreading of viruses and things like that. And below that, we have a Guardian article. A Guardian is, a, is an English newspaper and the link between COVID-19 and factory farming. <clears throat> this relates to some of the things that were talked about in the up here, the Verge article, uh, Foods of the Future or Crickets. And I'll be walking through some of those ideas in a Prezi that I'm going to give you today as well. But I'm going to be posting questions for these two articles by Friday. So we'll try to have those finished. And those questions will probably be due by next Monday. All right. So um, let's get into the Prezi I wanted to show you today, which is all about foods of the future and some of the ideas and issues that these things talk about. So what is wrong with meat? Well, problems with animal agriculture are a couple. Uh, first of all, environmentally, animal agriculture wastes resources like water, food, and land. Uh, there's tremendous waste of these things. I think it takes about, oh gosh, I want to say 100 gallons of water to raise one pound of beef. And in addition to this, in addition to this, uh, these feedlots, you can see a picture of a feedlot here where there's cows being raised for slaughter. Uh, they emit over 30% of total greenhouse gases. And greenhouse gases, of course, are a contributor to global warming and climate change. So 30% is more than all the cars in the world combined. So it's a significant amount. Uh, also health-wise, animal diets are often, uh, animal protein is often high in things like saturated fat, cholesterol, and animals are fed hormones, antibiotics. Uh, what that means is that when you are raising an animal for slaughter, at least when it's factory farmed, they give the animals large doses of antibiotics when they are not sick. And this creates an enormous potential for what are known as superbugs, that are that, that is virus viruses that are resistant to any kind of vaccine. Um, also, economically, it's not a viable option for developing countries uh, to set up systems like this would be way too expensive. Uh, there are not enough resources, literally, there's not enough food and water to feed the animals that you would be farming. So economically, it's not uh, possible for countries that are developing and not uh, and, and countries that are food insecure. Uh, this is not a, a reasonable or, or realistic option for them. So those are some of the concerns. Uh, now, why bugs? You've read the article on cricket protein at this point, and so you know some of the reasons why. But Bugs create much less greenhouse gases. Uh, they're very tiny as compared to chickens, cows, and pigs. So you have a lot less waste. Also, they eat a lot and drink a lot less than traditional animals as well, traditional agriculture animals. Um, and even though we in the West, what's known as the West, Western Europe and the United States, what we may look at consuming bugs as rather strange or maybe gross, we're kind of the odd people out in the world because, as you can see here, approximately 2 billion people around the world consume bugs as a part of their daily diet. Uh, the ancient Greeks and Romans ate bugs, uh, and many considered them a luxury food uh, that was only available for what were known as the patrician classes, which were the wealthy people. So it's almost like it was almost like caviar in, in, during those times, how we would look at that as a sort of luxury food. That's how the Greeks and Romans looked at bugs. If you were really rich and you had a fancy party, you would be serving bugs. Our ancient ancestors, who were hunter and gatherers, ate, ate bugs. Aristotle, really famous philosopher, likelihood is high that he was a bug eater as well. So where in the world do they eat bugs? Well, zoom in here. 23 countries in the Americas. Again, not North America and Canada, but in Mexico, they uh, eat things like the agave worm. If you've been down there, you can have tequila where you get the worm in the bottle. And chapulines, grasshoppers, and ant eggs. Uh, so it's very common in Central and South America. 36 countries in Africa and Ghana, they eat termites, South Africa, locusts. Uh, there's also mopani worms that are eaten in various countries in Africa. 11 countries in Europe, 29 countries in Asia, and the tropics, uh, Southeast Asia, is where bugs are really consumed regularly. Places like Thailand and Laos, fried bugs, you can get fried tarantulas. Uh, Australia also, the grubs, part of the original diet, uh, aboriginal diet. So a lot of countries in the world, uh, you can see up here it says, 
Countless cultures around the world eat insects as a delicacy or as a normal part of their everyday diet. Up to 80% of the world's nations eat insects with higher concentrations located in the tropics. Yeah. And again, the tropics are down here in places like Thailand and Laos and Vietnam. Okay, cool. So not so strange. Everybody else is doing it. Now, why bugs? Uh, let's see if we can get into this video. Hopefully the audio will work here. Yeah, here we go. For centuries, people have consumed bugs. Everything from beetles to caterpillars, locusts, grasshoppers, termites, and dragonflies. The practice even has a name, entomophagy. Early hunter-gatherers probably learned from animals that foraged for protein-rich insects and followed suit. As we evolved and bugs became part of our dietary tradition, they fulfilled the role of both staple food and delicacy. In ancient Greece, cicadas were considered luxury snacks, and even the Romans found beetle larvae to be scrumptious. Why have we lost our taste for bugs? The reason for our rejection is historical, and the story probably begins around 10,000 BC in the Fertile Crescent, a place in the Middle East that was a major birthplace of agriculture. Back then, our once nomadic ancestors began to settle in the Crescent, and as they learned to farm crops and domesticate animals there, attitudes changed, rippling outwards towards Europe and the rest of the Western world. As farming took off, people might have spurned bugs as mere pests that destroyed their crops. Populations grew and the West became urbanized, weakening connections with our foraging past. People simply forgot their bug-rich history. Today, for people not accustomed to entomophagy, bugs are just an irritant. They sting and bite and infest our food. We feel an ick factor associated with them and are disgusted by the prospect of cooking insects. Almost 2,000 insect species are turned into food, forming a big part of everyday diets for 2 billion people around the world. Countries in the tropics are the keenest consumers, because culturally it's acceptable. Species in those regions are also large, diverse, and tend to congregate in groups or swarms that make them easy to harvest. Take Cambodia and Southeast Asia, where huge tarantulas are gathered, fried, and sold in the marketplace. In Southern Africa, the juicy mopani worm is a dietary staple, simmered in a spicy sauce or eaten dried and salted. And in Mexico, chapulines are toasted with garlic, lemon, and salt. Bugs can be eaten whole to make up a meal or ground into flour, powder, and paste to add to food. But it's not all about taste. They're also healthy. In fact, scientists say entomophagy could be a cost-effective solution for developing countries that are food insecure. Insects can contain up to 80% protein, the body's vital building blocks, and are also high in energy-rich fat, fiber, and micronutrients like vitamins and minerals. Did you know that most edible insects contain the same amount or even more mineral iron than beef? making them a huge untapped resource when you consider that iron deficiency is currently the most common nutritional problem in the world. The mealworm is another nutritious example. The yellow beetle larvae are native to America and easy to farm. They have a high vitamin content, loads of healthy minerals, and can contain up to 50% protein, almost as much as in an equivalent amount of beef. To cook, Simply saute in butter and salt, or roast and drizzle with chocolate for a crunchy snack. What you have to overcome in ick factor, you gain in nutrition and taste. Indeed, bugs can be delicious. Mealworms taste like roasted nuts. Locusts are similar to shrimp. Crickets, some people say, have an aroma of popcorn. Farming insects for food also has less environmental impact than livestock farms do because insects emit far less greenhouse gas and use up less space, water, and food. Socioeconomically, bug production could uplift people in developing countries, since insect farms can be small-scale, highly productive, and yet relatively inexpensive to keep. Insects can also be turned into more sustainable food for livestock, and can be reared on organic waste, like vegetable peelings, that might otherwise just end up rotting in landfills. Feeling hungry yet? Faced with a plate of fried crickets, most people today would still recoil, imagining all those legs and feelers getting stuck between their teeth. But think of a lobster. It's pretty much just a giant insect, with legs and feelers galore, that was once regarded as an inferior, repulsive food. Now, lobster is a delicacy. Can the same paradigm shift happen for bugs? So give it a try. Pop that insect into your mouth, 
and savor the crunch. Okay, so interesting stuff there. Um, also, I wanted to show you something. Let me pause it for a second. I am on uh, Amazon, and I wanted to show you some products that are made from cricket flour. So here we have cricket chips. Now, they look just like normal chips, and I've had these, and I've had my students uh, every semester virtually. I have uh, these available for students, and they're actually pretty good. I mean, I think they're quite tasty. As you can see, they're a bit expensive, but there's 20 grams of protein, and uh, these are just some of the products being made from cricket flour. I can click over here, too. You can see they look like pretty much normal chips. There's no you know, grasshoppers there. And what they do is they take grasshoppers that they farmed, and they grind them, they bake them first, they wash them, then they bake them, and then they grind them up into a powder, like a flour, and just to use that instead of uh, traditional corn or wheat flour. This also, this is one of my students' favorites, actually. I had several students who, who went back and said, I really want to buy those. They were so delicious. Uh, these are cricket cookies. Same thing. They use cricket flour, and uh, it, a lot of students really enjoyed them. Again, pretty expensive because this is a relatively new and this is a relatively small company. But in the future, those prices may go down as more and more people start to switch to cricket proteins. Now, some of you, this is just not an option. And they look, they've got protein powder here. So all kinds of products that are made. And uh, Chirps is not the only company making this. There's also a company, what is it, NAC, I think? Yeah, NAC protein bars. There we go. So these are just your traditional sort of protein bars, but they're made with cricket protein. You can get those on Amazon as well. So those are just some of the products that are made, not from, uh, you know, straight up eating crickets, but they make a, a kind of flour out of them. And you can try those by going on Amazon and checking those out. But for some of us, this isn't really, um, this isn't really interesting. You don't want to do that. Well, for those of us who, who don't want to eat bugs, there's also uh, veganism has been on the rise lately. You probably know about plant-based diets. A lot of celebrities and a lot of athletes have have uh, uh, adopted vegan diets. And this is another way that people are sort of avoiding animals uh, uh, for various reasons, environmentally, health-wise, and ethically. So let me show you a little bit about the Impossible Burger. You've probably all, all heard of it at this point because they've been serving it in, in Burger King for some time now, the Impossible Whopper. Uh, you might've heard of Beyond Meat, uh, but you can see, I'm gonna show you this little thing on Wired Magazine all about how the Impossible Burger is created. The future of food looks like this. It's a new operation run by a company called Impossible Foods that's churning out something that looks, feels, tastes, and smells like ground beef. Hell, it even bleeds like a medium rare burger. But this patty is actually all plant, a product of genetic engineering. It's the first step in an effort to take on the multi-billion dollar meat industry. You won't be disappointed in these things, man. It's hard to overstate the magic of a traditional burger. The taste, for one, but also the smell and texture. That's thanks to lots of different kinds of proteins. Most importantly, myoglobin, which contains something called heme. That's the taste of iron. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Soy plant. We don't have much time left. I only have two minutes left. They basically go into a lot of the science behind so the Impossible Burger. But I can link this sure, up to our blackboard if you want to watch the whole thing. Say, I'll just forward to where the chef eats it here those particular proteins they're talking about the Understood. science behind it all comes it. down to these ingredients which include the heme wheat protein for texture and coconut as a stand-in for fat add them all together and it starts to look more and more like a beef patty the result is a meatless burger that's so convincing it may as well be meat all right pretty impressive we even asked our resident chef to give it a taste so it's really simulating that juicy center layer that you would get in a nice mid-rare burger. So on, you can see on the outside, we've got that nice golden crust, but in the center, it's still bloody and rare. Except this time, it's plants doing the bleeding. So let's see how it tastes. Okay. Wow. That is a lot better than I thought it would be. Wow. So why does a veggie burger need to bleed? Okay, so I'll link that up again. If you want to see it, let me know. Put it in the comment section. I only have about 30 seconds left. So, But in addition to that, there's lots of other vegan products that are being made available. It's a hugely uh, uh, profitable uh, sector right now is making vegan meats and things like that. But you see cheese and ice cream and 
chicken and waffles here. Okay, that's about all I got for you now. Um, make sure to read through those articles, and I'll see you on Friday.